welcome to our first I Heard Earth Facebook Live ever. Um, for those of you who don't know us, my name is Karin Eglinton, and this is my co-creator, Jennifer Harvey Salon, and we are here today to explore the idea of rewilding from a personal perspective to share a bit about our um, personal journeys with rewilding, what are we doing, why are we doing it, what it means to us. Um, so to give a bit of an overview, one thing that I want to say is like strictly speaking, if you hear about rewilding often in the media, they're talking about the idea of restoration of landscapes or ecosystems. So like when wolves were reintroduced to uh, Yellowstone or something like that, where um, a species gets reintroduced and it regenerates the whole environment. So what we're talking about in this is we're taking the idea of rewilding to a meta level and to our personal lives um, in the sense of undoing domestication patterns that are harmful to ourselves and that are harmful to our lives and to our environment and even relationally to each other. And so it's, it's like rewilding writ large and it becomes a whole kind of like a way of being, a way of walking in the world. So hi, Jen, and um, where, where should we start? Well, I was thinking about the, um, the whole history of how did we get into this to begin with? Because something that was uh, on my mind was it could seem ridiculous that two sort of white women, you know, in the Western world that are in a relatively privileged position come and talk about like rewilding as though we're some sort of heroes or something, which would be <laughs> completely absurd. Um, yeah. And I mean, really a lot of the work we're doing with I Heart Earth and a lot of the work that um, we're just doing for the uh, environment and climate advocacy and stuff is really coming out of the place of, this is who I am, this is where I ended up in my life because of the various circumstances and what can I do right now? Um, and like there's this challenge for a lot of people about being like, yeah, well, uh, how dare I go out and talk about something like that when other people are suffering so much, they don't even have the choice. Like for me to rewild seems like a privilege. Especially in right now. Especially right now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And um, and even sometimes like the little things I could be doing, the little the little things that I am doing could seem ridiculous too somebody who has to live on the land, for example. Uh, and I'm, you know, have my little garden and I'm thinking, oh, wow, I'm, I'm rewilding. So it could seem really completely absurd. And at the same time, uh, each person across the scale of privilege and uh, wherever anybody is at, they have their own responsibility to do what they can in this moment. And it's not easy for anybody to just jump from one life to another. So there's this whole transition, like this whole phase transition um, that we all need to go through. And for me, it's been really helpful to hear other privileged people say what they're doing to, you know, in their life, even if it's just um, little things, if it's big things or little things, it's really helpful for me to hear it from them because it's always like, it reminds me of the thing that when when, like when I was a kid and I would hear, um, you know, if you don't eat your food, you have to think about the starving children in Africa. This was something okay. I heard a lot. Yeah. yeah. And I would think, yeah, but I, it, this isn't the same thing. I, I, can't I can't send them the food. I can't send them my food. I can't send them the food on the plate. And if I eat and it hurts me because maybe I'm eating too much or I'm eating the wrong thing or whatever, I, does that really do them good? You know? Mm -hmm. So it kind of reminds me of that where it's like, I can't, force myself to fix the whole all the world's problems and uh, or be in a situation like deprive myself of everything because somebody else is being deprived of things that I couldn't to, like send them right now today kind of thing so I'm still doing something within the realm of what I can do and um, along my journey you know you've been an inspiration to me and other people who are speaking out about the things that they're doing in their own in their own life, like wherever they're at on the spectrum of privilege, it's been really helpful for me to recognize the areas that I can, where I can make a difference and, and make a change. So, I mean, in that optic, it's worth sharing a personal story. You know, it's worth sharing why I even thought of this and why it's important. And that's why I wanted to start with us sharing our stories. You in particular, because you've been really more active with this your entire life. I grew up kind of, you know, 
I was a nature kid for sure, but I wasn't as involved in like the, the um, environment as you were like right from the beginning. So I thought we could share our stories and then just, you know, kind of on the meta level, on a psychological perspective, it is, yeah, it's really empowering for us to be able to hear these stories from each other and to be able to just like literally tuning in from the heart, like and the body, like somebody sitting down, listening to what we're talking about, just having that connection because I mean, we're online. This is our, this is my first Facebook live ever. So <laughs> yay, I finally yay. catch up. <laughs> um, as usual, I'm the last one to adopt everything, uh, all the new technology <laughs> stuff, but, um, but um, just being able to sit with us and kind of even beyond the words, just experience the shared um, reality of what what this opens up and, and the portals that this opens up for people when they're being with us in our energy, there's something very powerful there as well. So um, so there's multiple levels, you know, in, in sitting here and us taking the time to sit here and talk about this and let other people hear our stories and where we come from. So yeah, a little bit of a, you know, paint the picture of why we're here talking about this and why it matters and why, you know, for our, anybody who's tuning in, why it matters that you share your own story as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I love what you're saying because that everything that you're saying resonates. And, and I think that um, it's, um, it's humbling in a way to do the little thing. Yeah, it the, is. You know, the, the thing that seems like a little gesture yeah. and sometimes could seem like an empty gesture uh but i i really have a lot of faith in that as well and that we sitting together like you're saying and sharing the little things that we do and letting those kind of resonate with others and that there's there's a lot of power in that as well yeah. and you know i i wanted to sort of share my journey as you were you know uh prompting me and um kind of start with the end first in in a sense because it dovetails with what you're saying which is the idea that I feel like us privileged white people are really the ones who need this the most um, as it's our culture specifically that's the one that's driving the disruption of the environment we need to remember what who we are in the in the web of life and so at the same time to what you're saying yeah it's like it could seem a little futile but it's also we are the ones who need that kind of medicine so yeah yeah so where should i start <laughs> well you were born in <laughs> <laughs> back in 1986 well yeah. that's that's the thing too it's part it, it is part of my ancestry to be sort of like straddling these two worlds because i was born in chile in 86 so it's it was a, a time of political post turmoil and uh, sort of like a, a country that was getting itself into the um, more sort of in the wake of the first world's uh, yeah. development and so on. So there's something to that where I always felt like our culture was like really striving to be like um, the, the you, you know, Europe, Europe and in the US. And at the same time, we have this incredible legacy of native cultures and um, of not being a developed country, you know, like with all the terrible things that that entails and um, a lot of beautiful things that are really embedded in the culture itself. And so, as I was saying to you right before we came online, I feel like my family, even within that, was a little feral. And <laughs> And Jen knows a lot of stories of my family, so she giggles on the inside because she knows. Uh, so let, let's just say my family was a quite, you know, sort of to the off to the side of the mainstream, and and both my parents were wilderness people. They met mountain climbing, and they took us camping when we were really young. And so there was like a a real sort of atmosphere of nature connection where I grew up, as well as this sort of fringy non-conformist <laughs> culture semi-culture that we created inside our little bubble and that made it um let's say sort of easy for me to look at things from the outside and to as i was growing up sort of 
notice that not everybody had this experience that I had of being uh, connected, not as this like, oh, we're such a nature connected family. Mm -hmm. It was just part of life. Yeah. And, um, and I was, uh, as I write about animism, so like the idea that everything is alive, that, you know, that everything is sentient, that there is a pervasive consciousness and, you know, like that plants are people and animals are people and mountains are people and so on. And that was really present for us, like it, it never left. And if you think about children, you know, we, we raise children to be animists, you know, like what does their teddy bear say? And what do the animals say in the stories? We're, you know, we're steeped in this very naturally. And then we sort of like grow out of it or culture takes us away from that. And now in my family, we never grew out of that. And it was just like that. So that that's a bit of the, um, the setup that I had and when I looked around me, let's say going to school, I was bullied really severely. And I saw lots of people who were bullied. And I got to hear a lot of stories of people's families and the abuse that was present there and so on. And I was like, something doesn't add up here. People are really unhappy and there's all this pain that they're passing on. And to me, that was some, somehow there was an intuitive understanding that it had to do with this idea of domestication. And that... Um, that led me to kind of want answers like this existential quest to understand why are we so unhappy why are we passing on so much pain to others why are we depressed angry um taking out that anger and frustration on others why are our lives filled with this sense of meaninglessness and um uh, and so it was like kind of like an antenna like constantly looking 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 and that, again, led me to start to go through faces where I would discover something about society and I'd be like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> so to give you an example, I was um, really young and uh, I don't know, must have been like eight, eight, eight or nine years old or something. And I learned about uh, factory farming mm -hmm. for the first time. And I, I was like, wait, what? Yeah. And if, you know, if you put that together with that, what I just said about my family and, you know, this animist way of being, I was like, I am never touching meat again. I, you know, it's like as a young child, I was so shocked and, and um, I didn't realize that all that suffering was being caused by our way of life. So that was one moment where I was like, whoa, we're doing this. I need to do something about this. I need other people to know about this. And so I became a very young vegetarian activist, <laughs> very like little girl in a you know heavily meat eating country, like where it's not a place where you can be a vegetarian easily or you just go to the supermarket and buy like the vegetarian option. That was yeah. not a thing. Um, and so I had moments like that and I was seeking that. And so every time there would be, you know, every few years I would have another realization about the world we live in and go, oh, it goes even deeper. There's more ways that we're disconnected and there's more ways that we're, um, yeah, the just creating hell for ourselves by ripping apart the connection, the bonds of connection that we should have with the way of life. Uh, the web of life and um and the environment and in destroying things for the sake of some kind of ideal but missing out on the on the consequences uh, you know so like short-sighted solutions and so on and then at some point in my in my adult life in my early 20s i uh, happened to be exposed to the idea of unschooling Mm -hmm. And so that was the thing that really clicked for me about the domestication piece. And so I just want to kind of tie this together with what I was saying earlier in terms of this being a thing that is not just about the landscape, but it's something that is you know, embedded inside our brains, inside our hearts, mm -hmm. and our bodies. So I, I started reading about homeschooling and then unschooling and the idea that um, that children would learn, you know, that within ourselves, we would have as children, the, the drive and the desire to learn without anybody telling us that we have to, 
which is, you know, we think about that when children learn to speak, for example, you don't have to force them to want to. It's the innate drive to communicate and to be social. Yeah. And so there was that idea, the idea that we are innately social and that we want to cooperate and that we don't have this antisocial drive inside us from the very beginning, that from the very beginning, we want to connect, we want to contribute to our families and our communities, and that we want to be like meaningfully engaged and want to be helpful. And so I read about all these homeschooling families and unschooling families who didn't socialize their kids um, and, you know, let them lead the way and what they wanted to learn and enlist not just family members but community members mentors and so on and these children were creating incredible things from a young age and so that made me go again wait what <laughs> yeah. all my life had been very much about education and that if we had better education things would be better and you know i um you know, really believed in school as a thing. And then here I was learning that actually it was a tool for domestication and for holding us back from what we could be creating and actually creating an alienation with, um, with adults. The idea that we would then, you know, sort of be in this environment where the adult is, is not necessarily safe and they might even be the enemy, like the teacher is somebody who is there to police you. Mm -hmm. And so there's not that sense of, trust where you know that they have your back and that you know that they're um they're supporting you in the best way they can it's more like a felt sense of am i in trouble <laughs> you know? yeah so with all that in mind i was like well if we're all going through this as you know a mandatory schooling and things like that different countries have different regulations on this then what does that do to us? How do we end up from one end being somebody who is inherently driven to um, contribute to the world and to be connected to somebody who might be, you know, we still have those drives, but there's something else that has been sort of programmed on top. And for some, it's really wounding. As I was telling you, you know, like I saw a lot of trauma in school. And for some people, it's really, um, really alienating and then it becomes this kind of exercise in futility you know when you go to school and then you go to your job and then you follow the prescribed plan and then what is life for that's how i perceived it at the time and then that sort of kindled something like a, a next level of desire to to live a life that um or place a trail or you know do something with my life that really helps open doors outside of a construct of futility. And, um, you know, at that same time, I was um, very completely immersed in a spiritual community that's an earth-based spirituality community. And um, so again, I was, you know, amplifying this, um, this experience and the ongoing you know, training and connection with nature to be um, in harmony with nature and to be connected, to be healed, to help heal others who are seeking healing and so on. So it's like opening again doors to, um, to an experience that changes you through being connected to something much, much greater than what we experience in the day-to-day -day world. Yeah. And so all of this came together for me to become like a, a robust path of, of rewilding. And then from then on, what I started doing was trying to acquire the skills, like the practical skills. Um, how do you build a fire? Um, what things can you preserve? What, what is edible? What is medicine out in nature? Um, how can you live off the grid? You know, like there's yeah. like so much to learn there. And so since then, that's kind of been my personal path is acquiring skills, learning what I could do, and then using, you know, money, resources, time to, to craft a life that, that follows that to the best of my abilities. So that's kind of that in a nutshell. I'm happy to clarify any parts, but um, so yeah, that's, that's where I've come from. Yeah, and if you could all see her garden, you would know that uh, <laughs> it's the wild, it's the rewilding paradise. Oh, my garden. Oh, yeah, it is so wonderful. 
And that's that's been kind of the most recent project, and I'm writing a little bit about it on my blog, which is, uh, you know, um, I've never had a lot of space, you know, like garden land space available. So I used to do like urban permaculture on my balcony. And <laughs> this was all kinds of crazy. Like I would, you know, collect like Rubbermaid tubs out of um, garbage containers for free to like plant little like raised beds on my balcony. <laughs> um and you know I try to have like composting worms and all kinds of like cool things that you can try out but you definitely like um beyond the traditional oh yeah yeah um so now I have um I'm lucky to have actually plenty of space and so I get to apply some of those permaculture principles to um, to actual land and and see it thrive and see the pollinators come in and all the different little critters come in. We had a hedgehog the other day, like right oh. in, in daylight. Oh my god! <laughs> oh yeah. So it's it's also yeah rejuvenating personally yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you think? I mean, we've been doing this uh, as the I Heart Earth theme for this year so far. And like, what do you think? I mean, you have a long history of engaging with this topic and also studying it, like also on also on an intellectual level. So not just like that you're you happen to be doing it physically, but that it's something that's totally integrated into the different parts of yourself. But do you feel like this year sharing the experience with our, you know, the people who are who who are engaged with our earth and with me? Um, and also just in general, like tuning into where the rest of the world is mentally, emotionally, mm -hmm. um, like, uh, how do you, have you noticed something different arising for you and your experience of rewilding? Like, has it come to a new level or have you learned particular things that have happened this year? Yeah. Yeah. There's been a lot. And uh, one part has been how I feel like some people have become a lot more receptive that you know the shocking uh experiences of the pandemic and all the crises are in the world have been the the strala broke the camel's back and they're looking they're like receptive and looking what can i do and so that has been i mean of course i've never wanted it to come to this but it's kind of like the silver lining yeah um in the sense that people are seeing that there are things that need to be done. And there's um, also, I don't wanna say energy. It's not like people, <laughs> it's like we have it suddenly have more energy than we used to. It's been super draining, um, yeah. but a, a galvanization, I guess, a sense of focus, a sense of, okay, we can't do everything. Yeah. We can't just continue life as we have so far. We have to actually, focus on the the problem yeah <laughs> like we have to really see the problem for what it is and do something about it so I've seen many people really want to do something and be receptive to the idea that um that bringing ourselves back into alignment into belonging with with life is one of the things to do yeah um so that's been one thing and the other thing is that there is an outpouring of grief and confusion and loss. And again, I, I'm not happy about that. And at the same time, it's like, you know, like lancing a boil, like there's been something festering for so long. The, the psychological impacts of um, the, the destruction of life have been so, you know, harming us for so yeah. long. And then suddenly people can, you know, um, make that conscious and see that and then say like oh, I don't know what to do I'm confused I feel dread I'm afraid of what's going to happen in the future and so it's like we're actually feeling the feelings and rewilding as a practice is like the thing that comes in and says yes and this is not the end mm -hmm. regeneration is possible um the earth has so much um powers that we not don't know about like coming from the mystical side of me like the power of earth is something that we just can't fathom what you yeah. can do and so when we align with that we actually get to participate in that and so on one hand it's good to really process the feelings and on the other hand there's like something beyond the feelings 
an, a horizon that we can walk towards. And, and I think that's just such a great antidote to despair. Yeah. 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 Seeing the capacity of people to take action and the way that that gen engenders hope and yeah and willingness um, to participate really participate in the aliveness and regeneration yeah and, and you know I, I don't know like i said this is like the mystical side of me talking um you could say but i also see people changing through that mystical encounter so it can be the simple mystical of planting some plants and then harvesting your raspberries your very own raspberries <laughs> which i know you did <laughs> <laughs> i haven't harvested my raspberries yet um, and then you know having that direct experience and then then there's that that changes us to hope and then there's also the thing you know like the practical logical side of us that could say there's something i can do yeah there's a, something the, a way that i can engage so it's like you don't have to be in a kind of nature-based ecstasy to to be in this but it's kind of a nice a nice side effect <laughs> Yeah, for, especially for people who need that to really yeah. be motivated. I mean, there are people who go through their whole lives who don't need yeah. to, to experience anything mystic and they can still show up and be wonderful human yeah. beings and generative and everything else. But there are some of us who we need that. We need to tune into that side of yeah. that dimension of things to really feel connected and to feel motivated to wake up in the morning. Yeah, I've exactly. always joked, like, even if that side of life would be like just um, an imaginary thing. It's still, you know, it's very motivating for me. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was one thing that I had to work through specifically in my journey, actually, because I come at it from this kind of um, the spiritual side as well as the practical side. And I had to be like, I had to question, you know, like, what if all the things that I'm being told about Earth and the magic of life are not real? Would I still do this? What if there's no transcendence in this? Would I still do this? And I always came back with the answer, yeah, it, you know, there is something inherently, you know, to me morally right about preserving and strengthening the ecological aliveness. Uh, and then and that's what gave me the ability to, you know, play with the other stuff and let it motivate me anyway. Yeah. 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 Totally. So anybody else who's listening, who is like a real lover of nature, maybe these things resonate because, yeah. you know, it, it is a grappling process too. Yeah. Yeah. And Jen, you have a completely different angle through which you arrived at this. And I'm sure our um, viewers are going to be very eager to find out how you dove into this, especially because of, you know, your career and your work have been in, you know, could seem like such a different area yeah. of, the, of knowledge in the world, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, tell us. <laughs> well, that, that has been quite the journey to try to figure out how to marry these two aspects. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, for me, this last year, my rewilding has been about how do I not backtrack from what I've been doing, but how do I think, how do I grow it in a direction that is more aligned to what the world is experiencing right now, which is happening very fast. I mean, all the changes are happening really fast and um, that has not been an obvious answer. I mean, everybody who's been following us through Intergifted and through I Heart Earth has seen uh, to some degree, has seen my process of trying to figure out how to how to marry these two things because that I mean I'm super passionate about supporting gifted people and and that work and at the same time when I wake up and I know what the world is going through I can't just live in a bubble and pretend like as long as we um, do our you know gifted specific self development everything's going to go great you know the IPCC report that just came out says yet again oh we have you know basically eight years to get our shit together and um, I mean eight years pass so fast. Uh, so if I'm only focusing on one thing that's not, you know, kind of addressing this bigger issue, I, I just can't wake up and feel motivated to do my life. So this question has been like, how can I do that? And rewilding has been an important part of that because it's helped me to, I mean, the whole thing of rewilding, it's like, it shakes everything up. That's when, you, when you're in wild life, you're really like living in the moment 
and you can't think, okay, I, I know what I'm doing for the rest of my life. Like if I could, if I just put myself in the gifted bubble, I could just plan that for the rest of my life. And, you know, kind of like the old uh, boomer thing of just, you know, uh, work for 35 years in one place and retire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're going to buy a um, cabin on the lake and live the rest of your days out. Like, like that is not the world we live in at this point. And um, that is a very domesticated version of life. Mm -hmm. The one we live in right now is like, I mean, a crazy storm could, as we're seeing all around the world, a crazy storm could come in tomorrow and ruin my house and ruin everything um, and kill me. So, I mean, what am I doing today and how is that plugged into hopefully making myself survive uh, and the people I love and maximizing the chances of survival for our planet and every and, you know, all the beings in it. Um, so that has been quite the challenge this year. and engaging in the rewilding has helped to bring myself back into my body um sort of back really back into the present moment um and it's kind of interesting that my body has been sort of the barometer for what's been going on in the world uh i tend i've always tended to somaticize things as you know we've talked about it a lot behind the scenes and so when things are going weird in the world i have tended to have weird weird freak symptoms of all mm -hmm. kinds and um and i i would just want to jump over those symptoms and be like that's not happening i continue i'll just continue doing my plan i'll just continue working in my bubble i'll just continue um with my life as i had imagined it uh and then my body's like you know like a hammer it's like you you shall not do that you will pay attention to what's going on around and you will adapt. And so uh, a lot of this has been sort of this feedback cycle where it's like, um, my body says you shall adapt. And then in looking at my body and really taking it seriously and whatever the freak symptoms have been, and there've been quite a number of years, um, it, it's like, I've had to come back into my body, recognize, um, like it's need not to be so domesticated that the domestication is literally killing it. Um, mm -hmm. And then how do I rediscover faith in my body's capacity for regeneration? So I have felt this kind of sort of internal drama about my body and is it is it capable of recovering? Each time I would get one of these freak things, it's like, Oh my God, no, it's like, this, this is going to take me down some terrible path, like mm. to, you know, permanent disability or whatever very strange outcome is going to happen, like strange, terrible outcome is going to happen because of this thing. And so then tuning back in and going, is this really the way it has to go? And how can I get back into my regular rhythms so that this uh, changes direction and doesn't turn into this terrible future that I'm imagining in my head and so then that feeds back into this cycle of being like more attuned more in my you know wild cycles and um and sort of like able to connect these parts of my life all of these different parts of my life the gifted specific work like my regular private life and my thoughts and actions and everything else. And then the, the climate and the ecological situation and everything else. So like, okay, putting these things sort of back together. And the interesting thing is, so I've had to unlearn a lot of things you were talking about unschooling. So it's like, I feel like the this focus on rewilding, especially this last year, and as it links to the symptoms question, the freak symptoms, um, it's been like, okay, how do I, how do I unlearn all these things that we, that I was taught about my body as a woman, mm -hmm. that I was taught about my body from many doctors that I saw that told me, you know, absolute truths about my body and it's non-capacity for healing and regeneration. Um, and this is just specific to my body, but like, since my body's been the barometer of, you know, my physical body's been the barometer of many dysfunctional beliefs <laughs> that that have passed my way have passed through my reality this is this is the most you know symbolic thing i could talk about there are other ways this shows up but this is the most symbolic way 
Um, and so unlearning these things. So I've read like, yeah, I mean, I read a lot, but this particular topic has been one of my main ones in the last year, which is um, how, do, how do people heal? How do people have spontaneous remissions? How do people um, rediscover faith in their body and reconnect to the health, you know, healthy rhythms uh, and slowing down and uh, doing all of the things that they need to do to heal from freak things? And, um, and like a lot of that's come with uh, studying doctors who talk about how the, the domesticated medical system is totally broken and explaining why and explaining why uh, doctors don't encourage uh, patients to believe in their own body's capacity for rehealing, for regeneration and healing and so on and so forth. And so in this process, I like get in this feedback loop where, okay, so I, this year I also have this wonderful garden that I started a couple of years ago, but now it's really growing into this fantastic thing. I'm looking out at it now. Um, and my, you know, plant house uh, is super full. And as I'm taking care of these living beings around and, and cultivating this, I see myself in their capacity for healing. And then when I'm watching myself heal, I'm, see, uh, I'm seeing like, ah, yeah, yeah, actually, if my, bo my body's nature, so if they can do it, I can do it. And if I can do it, they can do it. And that spreads really wide because then I think when people talk about like the coral reefs and uh, everything that's dying, I'm like, yes. And if we take action now, uh, a lot can change, like a lot. Like you can have some little, little bit that's still alive uh, and it can come back to life. Like even if it doesn't look like it, we had a tree, for example, uh, a small tree and it looked completely dead after the winter. And then, so we cut the top of it and cleared off all of the dead roots and replanted it, crossed our fingers and the next summer it re, re bloomed and now it's like super tall and doing wonderful. Um, and I've had, you know, several in less, less dramatic instances of that. But even there was the one time that you had shared about the orchid that was dead mm -hmm. and came back to life at a key time that I was, um, working on some important body healing. So there's these like little, little things that I'm tuning into now because of having this rewilding um, and regeneration and all of the reason that I think about, you know, recon reconnection and remembering, remembering the capacity of my own body, resilience. Um, and, you know, these things are going on in my mind all the, all the time and I'm looking for opportunities to practice that uh, and, you know, connect with that on a daily basis. And um, as that happens, then I'm like, hey, I have this space here to connect to the bigger world and go, mm -hmm. the coral reefs could probably recover if we do something about it today. Uh, but yeah. we really have to do some unlearning about what, what we are. And uh, so like on the larger scale, some of my, I don't want to, I don't want to say it was total unlearning, but there was an aspect of unlearning for me with regards to human exceptionalism. So I was raised in a strict religion as many, anybody who's followed my work probably knows. Um, and we were, even though we were taught, you know, don't be of the world. So like, don't value possessions and don't value, you know, high cons uh, consumerism and these kinds of things. This would be kind of considered like not really godly or something. Um, yeah. So it wasn't like, you know, go out and dominate and kill everybody or something. But it was like, um, also like, you know, we were, we were given dominion over the plants and animals and all of the things of the world. This was the language that we were told. And so there was still this idea that, you know, and also the whole story about like God dying for our sins as humans and this whole, you know, this, that's how you can be saved and you go to heaven and like what happens to the rest of the animals? I mean, who cares because they don't have souls. And mm -hmm. so there was definitely this like dualism there and human exceptionalism there. And um, so e even though I left religion yeah, and when I was around 20, um, I don't know, this stuff is some, somewhere still I it's not like I, you. you know, when I was 20 that I decided, okay, I'm going to like confront all of my beliefs about human exceptionalism. I was kind of like, that sucks. I'm running away from it, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't want to think about it anymore. And so it's been now coming back and where I'm really studying it and going, where did these kinds of just these little things come from? And these little beliefs in my head or these things that I 
you know, I mean, even just the dumb thing that I used to kill spiders all the time. And now I would like never even think about killing a spider. I'm like, what was I thinking before? I don't know. I wasn't thinking about it. Like I didn't grow up thinking about that, even though, I mean, I've always been compassionate, but I mean, a spider was just an insect. So, you know, um, so this human exceptionalism thing and seeing that um, it's just like this myth that we've been sold and especially I grew up in America in the eighties, you know, yep, yep. the greatest nation on earth, all of that rhetoric. Uh, and even if I didn't necessarily believe it, I mean, it's still, you want to talk about privilege. Like I was at the top of the privilege chain in, in a sense, you know? Yeah. Um, so it could be tempting to buy into the whole, you know, human exceptionalism thing. And so uh, I did a lot of study around that and unlearning around that as well. Uh, so those are two ways that, yeah, those are, have been two, two sort of portals for me. Big portals. Very big portals, yeah. Yeah, big portals. I think it's really funny too, as you were saying the, the thing about give, being given dominion in the human exceptionalist way. And then when I was a little kid and I stopped eating meat, do you have any idea how much people preached at me? And I they bet. said, I, I want to I wanna highlight this not for the fun of sharing it, but because it's interesting when you step out of line of the story, you know, the myth of human yeah. exceptionalism, how much policing you get. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I was a kid, so I was like lower in the, um, in the hierarchy. <laughs> and yeah. so it was easy for people to take out their frustration at me <laughs> for yeah, I bet. You know, not walking uh according to the the exceptionalism myth and so you know people would tell me you know like they would quote the bible at me yeah and tell me how i was doing wrong by god by not eating of the of the animals and you know and so there was a lot of that and that i was what was it one of the funniest things that i was ever told was you're discarding millions of years of evolution <laughs> is what i was told right <laughs> and the way that our bodies are now evolved and our beings are now evolved to consume other animals which just for the record i do eat meat now uh and i understand that in the in the animal paradigm of life humans are omnivores and and so i have nothing sort of like morally against meat eating per se it's the factory farming and the damaging of of the land and of the animals that I care about but it's just like it's like people would start getting like freaked out it's like wait wait no this is not what we're doing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah. so I think what you're sharing is, is it's like such a huge portal actually yeah yeah I mean even now I get a bit of policing here and there and I'm of course just I mean I'm in my 40s now so I just laugh and go uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> right <Yes. laughs> Thanks for your opinion, bye. But it's true, and and you know, gifted specific. Uh, I mean, I didn't, I didn't in my twenties, especially. I, I really didn't want to give more reasons for people to, you know, think I was weird and whatever else. So a lot of times, I just went along. Like when I was on my own, I barely ever had meat. But mm -hmm. when I was out with the people, I never said anything about. I, my qualms about yeah. eating meat, for example. Um, and it's only even like in more recent years that I'm like, okay, so I will just be out about this and I will inconvenience people uh, by saying, I prefer not to have meat. So please don't serve it to me. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, but it's taken me all this time because there was a lot of me that was like, I'm already very overwhelming to people. <laughs> uh, just like kind of naturally with the way my brain works. So I don't, you know, I don't want to give them additional reasons to, yeah. so that was always kind of challenging for me. Like, and I think a lot of, if, you know, we have our gifted friends listening, I think that, that a lot of people will identify with that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it's like, it was the other side of the spectrum. I was like, what else do I have to lose? I'm already the weirdest weirdo. Uh, yeah. Because you had a, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah. it, it was it was certainly painful and alienating because it highlighted every time that yeah. that yes you are the weirdest weirdo on the planet of the people you know and 
<laughs> but but it also gave me this like this attitude of like yeah what what do I really have to lose anymore yeah. and and we've talked about this in terms of like our kind of like opposing not opposing but like sort of like uh, opposite ends of the spectrum of how we've responded to things and um I can say as we're speaking about the body you know there's also only so much contempt that a body can hold and yeah. until I started to feel physical symptoms from all that alienation so mm -hmm. it's like it leads to the same place in some ways yeah yeah um and I really really love that you brought up your body portal and how beautiful it, you know how beautiful it is to have that return to the body and and the um seeing the parallels between like you as nature and yeah. the nature around you yeah yeah that's been super powerful and healing from you know from me growing up which was like you're not nature you're you know god's creation and also all of the repression that came from being in such a strict religion regarding me especially as a female a female body um you know so like as a, a sort of side effect, I mean, I've done a lot of healing from those years anyway, but through this lens, there's this, there's a next level of healing as well, where I really get to see myself as, as nature and to see the res resilience in that. So like, I can wake up now and be like, okay, whatever comes up, my body's very wise and it knows how to regenerate itself. And I can tune into that. But, you know, I do want to say, this has been a lot of work, like, and one thing, I mean, you know, as a psychologist and coach over the years, like people would say, oh, wow, that's great what you've been able to do. I want to do that. And then when they find out how hard I worked at it, then suddenly they're like, I don't know. I don't think, you know, and because I mean, the amount that I've read and the amount of hours I spent in meditation and the amount of hours that I've spent talking to you, talking to Aurenia, my husband, talking to, you know, therapists and everything else and exploring this in so many different ways, I mean, it's a lot of work. So not everybody, you know, comes at it with the same amount of um, need to unlearn things. It's, you know, not everybody has the same background as me, but uh, but at the same time, I think for a lot of us, any of us who have really um, been steeped into the domesticated version of life, I mean, it takes an enormous amount of unlearning. And I think part of my frustration uh, in, in talking with people is, um, this sort of denial that it's going to take a lot of work. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, that's part of the domesticated yeah, uh, mind space, right? Like that yeah. things happen immediately. I'm curious if you could pinpoint or, or if not, you know, like I'm curious to hear how, it, how it's been for you. If you could pinpoint like a moment or a series of moments that made you go, okay, this parallel, you know, my body is nature, my my regeneration means that nature can regenerate and vice versa. Like, when did that click? When did that like really settle? Like, what made you go, okay, this is rewilding? Well, interestingly, a lot of it was about boundaries. So, um, you know, I'm my the Intergifted Project is growing quite big. The organization is growing quite quite big, and um, as you know, since we work together behind the scenes, I I've had to do a lot of, um, you know, next level next level leadership uh, skill development, um, and that has included a lot of understanding how do you have very healthy boundaries at this level of leadership. Um, and so as that has been happening, then I've been able to also see, I mean, again, like, thanks, thanks to my plants and also to my adorable cats. Um, I've been able to see that there are times you just have to cut off a, like you cut off the top of the tree because that's the only way it's going to survive. Yeah. And if you don't cut off the top of the tree, the, the sort of half dead branches are um, going to take too much energy from the tree and then it's going to end up it's dissipated the energy is dissipated and so it can't regenerate in like one new healthy branch basically you know so there are these things where you're like you have to make these tough calls you have to cut uh <laughs> cut it off sometimes um or other kinds of uh boundary and like enforcement or whatever um not planting things in certain places because of what they like don't plant mint there because it's going to take over everything else 
And so knowing how each of the plants work and where, how they grow or don't grow and what they do in the root systems with the other plants and this kind of stuff has really helped mirror back to me, okay, that sometimes you gotta make tough calls also with your body, like to protect your body and to protect the nature of the body. And also then in the mind, like I um, could, you know, in my, when I'm not in my most healthy place, I could have, I have, I've never been diagnosed or anything, but I have a version of OCD that like, it's a health OCD and it'll go like, you have this problem and that problem. And then, and then you know, I can imagine like the worst scenarios till the end of all time. Um, and um, I've had to figure out the boundaries for that. When, what, how, how much time am I allowed to think about a symptom? And then when is it the time for me to say, you you have to stop? So like also this internal um, healthy monitoring that's like, okay, this is where the boundary is. So figuring that out within the context of what I just talked about, about, you know, this, my body representing the outside and everything. Um, I also like have, because it's a, it's a perfect like one-to-one -one metaphor because the outside I could obsess about, we're all going to die. We're all, the whole earth is going to, you know, like, I don't want the giraffes to die completely. I don't want, like, I love wild animals. I do not want a world without wild animals. I don't want a world without bees. I don't. And so this could go into a kind of like earth health OCD. I could mm -hmm. definitely have a version of that, you know, in a not non-balanced moment. And so it's also been like, okay, when do I cut that off? in terms of like any sort of rumination and how do I channel the energy that's generate that's um, generating the rumination and what do I do with it? So it's been kind of like ironically figuring out where are the boundaries of things and putting them in place, like in the way nature does, uh, not in the way my domesticated self would do like, well, hold on, I'll see if, and maybe I should just, and whatever. So it's been these things working in, in concert with each other that have really helped me to go, okay, this is, um, this is really about like this grounded actions, like cyclical action that has to be taken and you can't get lost in, in d distractions and um, dead ends, dead end paths and this and that. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, there's, there's always some, you know, just distraction yeah, and dead end paths exist. So it's not like, it's not like every day I wake up with a clear, like I said, <laughs> I mean, you know, that's not very realistic, but at the same time, you know, I have more of a capacity to say no, when no is, is the case. And so, for example, with my body, um, being able to say if a doctor says this is this this is what's going to happen and um not immediately saying oh my god he's probably right that's exactly what it, being like no i'm not going down that path like that's not the way that i'm looking at my body like it does have capacity for regeneration so i'm just not going to engage with that way of looking at things because it's a that has a whole sort of epistem epistemological um story to it and i don't I don't agree with the roots of it, you know, um, based on what I know about nature at this point and including my body. So again, having these really clear boundaries and this is how it's all connected for me, which is like kind of annoying and cool and, <laughs> and all of the things at the same time. It's like the beauty and the frustration of life, you know, totally. in totally. one crystallized instant. Totally. You know what it makes me think about since you were talking about human exceptionalism is like this other idea of exceptionalism of being exempt from rules. Also, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. yeah. How the human exceptionalist narrative would place our culture sort of not just above as in a hierarchy, but also like the rules of nature, the loss of nature, the loss of the universe consequences wouldn't apply to us. So yeah. you could then create a lot of quote, dead end paths yeah. mentally or like uh, technologically or philosophically or interpersonally that lead nowhere yeah. when you connect them back to the laws of nature because that has like real consequences. So there's things that you're free to do in yeah. the exceptionalist model that you're not free to do in the nature connected model because nature is going to give you immediate consequences well, <laughs> immediate well, <laughs> sometimes no. you can hold out for a really long time but you get your consequences yeah 
no it's true and also like that's helped me to balance out again the gifted and um you know the focus on you know high intelligence and the on like nature here and now nature connection and rewilding is like um figuring out again the, yeah the boundaries of like how, because you can philosophize till the end of all time and maybe uh, earth is being destroyed in the meantime and you're going yeah i understand this and i understand that and then there's that and then there's that and oh, okay like yeah that's kind of cool but it becomes um you know sort of a hall of mirrors uh, and then what are you doing in real life and how are you connect like how how are you you know dealing with the rest of everything outside of the like sort of abstractions so figuring out also the boundaries like around yeah when when do i stop my gifted mind from learning learning more and learning more i mean even this for me like the unlearning i'm learning more but i'm unlearning and getting back to 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 something simpler and i think that's kind of hard for a lot of people who have like let's say intellectual overexcitability who are like yeah but yeah but i just need to learn the next thing and then you know and you know with that a lot of times comes this intellectual fear of missing out if i don't know the next big thing you know i, I can't take time to rewild and tune into my body because there's so many things to know and I got to read the next books from this person and that person and know all of the next theories and everything else. So um, yeah, it's also been important for my work for bridging these, like this, the boundaries, like what are, what are the boundaries and when, when is um, all of the abstraction, the intellectual abstraction, when does it become, yeah, these kinds of dead ends, like, like life destroying dead ends. And when is it generative and really paying attention to noticing when, you know, when is what, when is my intelligence plugged into actual real consequences and managing those? And when is it just sort of in la la land, uh, not plugged into real consequences, then the real con consequences are happening. And I'm over here going, oh yeah, isn't this theory interesting? Yeah. So <laughs> I, uh, well, I particularly love this tangent because as you know, I'm writing about this for yes. the emergence compilation with Kelly Pride and the Gifted Mindfulness Collective. Yeah. Um, I was, and there's something in what I'm writing that I think is relevant to what you're saying, which is that intelligence itself as a construct has been used to further the human exceptionalism agenda. Yeah. And so in the work that you and I do in the gifted world, we're actually also using all that we're learning in rewilding to bring a holistic view back to intelligence and to remind people, like gifted people, and in the advocacy that we do, um, that you know that intelligence never was that. That's just one story of intelligence, and it's, it's been co-opted. And yeah. yet, there's a lot of long-lasting. Oh, yeah. associations and ways that gifted people feel like they maybe need to legitimize their intelligence by being disconnected from the holistic self. Totally. And that reminds me of kind of what I was thinking of before as you were talking about the, like the portal of my body is like this feeling of relief that's come through mm -hmm. the unlearning of all of the stories about like how bodies are fragile and uh, uh, I mean, obviously above a certain threshold yes they are fragile but you know that threshold is way higher than many of us have been taught over the years through conventional medicine um so uh and also the mind is way more resilient and the heart and all of the yeah. parts that that make us ourselves and um mentally i have to say as well like as a gifted person um the rewilding aspect rewilding my mind in the sense and this unlearning that and undomesticating has been a huge relief as well it's like even though i could tell myself intellectually i don't have to do the million things yeah it was like in there somewhere you know so i could i could like sit with it in meditation and be like i don't have to it's fine like i'm being you know calm but in the body it's like let's go let's go let's go there's more to learn you know you got to keep going and, and with the rewilding and i mean i can do those things but there's also like a real con consequential world right here <laughs> right here in my garden and right here with whatever i'm doing now that doesn't require reading 27 more books by tomorrow kind of thing do you as you as i'm hearing you do you experience it as like kind of like a plugging in or would you describe it as something else 
You said plugging in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I don't, I wouldn't describe it like that. I would describe it like, I don't know, some, there's some sort of origami shape. <laughs> That's cool. And then, it, and then it just gets like, it all gets unfolded and flattened out. Oh, like, yeah. All okay. the paper is still available. It's all still, but it's not, you know, crunched up into a certain shape. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. Yeah. I'm tuning into what you're saying and, and also, you know, my own experience of that and clients and peers, gifted peers who are also kind of folding themselves into all the different shapes to try to achieve the multidimensionality of their mind. Yeah. And then this kind of uh, gives it a completely different approach. Yeah. Because there's, I mean, there's the feeling like I could fold myself up like that for a little while if I wanted to, but knowing how to unfold myself is really important. And I think mm. that's where, you know, in some ways I wasn't able um, I think, you know, it feels good to be able to stay unfolded most of the time. And then fold myself up for things that I really care about and that are really, out of choice. Yeah. Yeah. That are really linked to my values and um, that are, you know, connected into the consequences of, of right now. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to in these narratives about it someday in the future, if I just do enough, you know, mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. This if I just do enough is something that I hear a lot from um, from our community too. Yeah. And and I think it does tie with the exceptionalism from a different angle in the sense of like, uh, I could be doing more and also as humans, we're the cause of the problem. So we should yeah. be doing more. Yeah, exactly. Which is, yeah, could can get into a total loop. I mean, if you think about an animal doing that in nature, then you yeah. think that's a neurotic animal. Something's, yeah. something has gone wrong in the, yeah. in the, you know, in the neurons. So like to see us doing it as well is, is quite interesting. Yeah, but it's also why I love the the body connections that you keep bringing in and the relief, the being present, um, because it is is really kind of reminding us of our place in connection to everything else, and that it doesn't have to be guilt ridden or displaced energies. It could be um, sort of in concert with, and then yeah, exactly have a agency and choice as to when and where to um origami fold yeah and create shapes yeah, yeah. and also the like the ability to change to change the shape to fit the situation yeah you're kind of like always in a shape and it's harder to you know then, yeah, exactly then you're stuck in that shape even if the <laughs> situation is calling for an entirely different one yeah Yes, I love that. And I feel like that that in itself is also another layer of relief, like an emotional relief for a lot of uh, a lot of us. And I know that um, I went through a process, too, of having to include myself in nature, mm. Mm, you know, because I started so young, there was a lot of carried emotions for me in the in the suffering that I saw in nature. And in the pain that I experienced sort of empathically of the destruction that we were causing. And as I was saying, also in the, the long-term repercussions that I saw psychologically for people of being disconnected, there was like a lot of like, oh my God, I need, I'm the only one who could see this in, in my environment. I was the only one or one of few. And so I have to hold this pain and just yeah. do um do whatever I can and it was when I really started including myself my body and my mind in the process of of rewilding as I am also nature I'm also a an ecosystem and I'm the closest ecosystem that I have and so and this is the one I'm the most responsible for of all of them without yeah. this little rainforest yeah <laughs> I can't help anyone yeah so it's like a different version of putting on your oxygen mask versus completely yeah. different but it kind of amounts to the same thing it was like an appreciation that nature is also not just the pristine landscapes of um you know natural parks it is this 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 domain as well yeah yeah, and I mean, getting into the body and, and living nature through the body is obviously, obviously helps with reality-based assessment. Exactly. <laughs> or what you know, what can be done on the outside, and yeah. um, and also like 
reality-based assessment, it could sound, you know, only like a sort of more limiting or negative approach, but I mean that in the best sense as well, as I described in my own process, like realizing how resilient I am because of tuning into the resilience of the body. I'm, I'm sorry, re, re, uh, remembering how resilient nature is because of, I mean, nature on a bigger scale because of tuning into the resilience in my body. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 It's been journeys. And, yeah. and I love also that we can share how unique each one is and so, and how contextual. I think that's also part of what we wanted to bring across in the rewilding um exploration through i heard earth is that it's also local and highly contextual yeah yeah so um did you want to share a little bit about your uh, or your side with um uh, being local with things which i know that ties into everything that you just said um you mean local to my body or local to my space here both yeah I mean, because it is like a, such a unique personal journey. It's not personal as in like an off in a bubble, but it's personal in that yeah. like nobody else could have repeated everything that you just shared. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, for me, it's been a lot about like just tuning into the daily life. Like I, I you know, sort of had these big dreams of I'm going to travel the world and all of these things that had, you know, I gathered up in my 20s. Uh, and then, so figuring out how to shift the energies toward being more local. And we had talked about this on a previous um, recorded conversation, just kind of finding the joy in the local things. And that has grown since we recorded that. It was in 2019, I think we recorded that. And that's just continued to grow, like finding the joy in doing my garden and, um, you know, fulfilling a lot of other local things that have gotten like left behind. Mm -hmm. um you know like maintenance that hadn't sort of yeah. life maintenance that hadn't been done you know I could even mm -hmm. say the same for my body um in some weird way I mean not tuning into the nature of it and just kind of being like okay you're you're a machine that will continue to function for my for my mind to keep doing its thing I and mean, I wasn't in a total split but I mean it's so interesting to discover even when you think you're not in a in a split then you look a little bit deeper and oh, well there are still areas of split so um so yeah and then um you know discovering my bioregion and tuning into like life here learning about the water cycle here learning about um the ge you know, like the geolo geological past of my re region here in switzerland and yeah it's like kind of understanding nature totally differently. Like it's not one of the big things that uh, I, that kind of struck me uh, in getting into ecological work in general was how much we view nature as a background for the real story of our lives or for the real drama or something. Um, and I thought, oh my God, that's true. I do this, of course I do this. Like there's this whole narrative about me and my life. And then nature is the background and you know I've always like I've been a nature photographer since I was a kid um and I was always like it's so beautiful it's so pretty and I was connected to it but it was still a background it wasn't like necessarily me really living with it like being it and living with it and so that's yeah that's a total shift for me yeah, yeah. it's so true what you're saying like I'm mean, like I see that very strongly everywhere yeah. And like even the narratives about environmental um, activism often yeah. speak about it because that's how people understand it. You know, like yeah. let's save nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's something I've read a lot about as well, about the the issues with um, environmental activism, kind of talking about us saving nature from a human exceptionalistic point and an extractivist culture point of view, and how it how there's there are ways to resolve that there's a book out um we can put a link to it i don't remember what it's called i don't, I don't remember names of books <laughs> but there is a book exactly on this that just came out and it's available on open source by a person named blanche but i can't remember her last name either so we'll just put it in the in the in the comments i'm making it. i'm making a note so that we'll remember blanche yeah. okay yeah. Um, and so what is, I'm curious your, your answer to the same question. And then I'm curious if we have questions. I don't, I, you know, given that this I is my first Facebook live, questions. I don't see how this. Okay. I, uh, 
it doesn't look like we have questions. We had some viewers, but we can open up for questions. Okay. Well, so whoever's listening, if you have questions you want to ask, uh, now's the time. It's now or Drop never. Drop them in the comments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, well, um, what the context of my sort of deepening into uh, the local has been that a few years ago, we moved to the city that I live in right now, Leipzig in Eastern Germany. And we just happened to be incredibly lucky to find a place to rent, which was a house in an old village on the outskirts of the city. And so we're almost in the country. There's like, you know, like uh, grain fields around us and little forests. And um, so it's been partially like a matter of being new to the place and and being like ready to discover and ready to explore and like discovering what um you know what the terrain is here we have like marshlands and repairing forests here it's one of the um biggest untouched repairing forests in europe or something like that it's like wow. it's pretty like pretty impressive and there's also like man-made lakes so there's a lot of this kind of interplay between preserved nature and then like a lot of uh, human uh, intervention and then the pandemic hit and we were very very confined to our home and lucky that we do live where we do because we have a lot of places to go to that we can walk to and then still be kind of in life and not literally locked up um so that took me on something that I would have done wherever I went you know like exploring the the place that I live in but it made it so that I would develop a, a specific relationship with the place I live in and considering that um, for a lot of time we had kind of issues with people not keeping to the regulations of um you know masks and so on here like I didn't feel quite safe just sort of like roaming a field I was like very much like forced to be in my literal walking environment and um and there's you know highways and um forest paths and the little town and so on and so like areas that are not really developed areas that are in development so there's like this interplay between the kind of like pristine nature and the human um kind of built environment and it's made me kind of think about the idea of what the the new wild is going to be i'm actually there's a book called the new wild and it kind, kind of touches on this um so i'm also making a note that we can drop it in the in the comments later um so this idea of the new wild in the sense that like rewilding you know it kind of comes with this idea of restoring something to what it used to be and I'm playing with and exploring the idea that there's going to be a new wild that is not what we've had before. Um, you know, like I'm thinking about the documentaries on Chernobyl and what it's like now. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's like you can never undo the effects that human life had and human civilization had on that space. Yet you get to see like so much of, you know, like what are the species that are thriving with us? What are the um, the weeds that are like growing there? What, you know, who are the like the insects that are thriving when when we're in lockdown? <laughs> so it kind yeah. of became this this project of exploration, and then um, then then we started um, doing a lot of foraging with my husband. Um, we happen to have like nut trees around, so it's like it's been this kind of like, okay, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. So get acquainted and find out what yeah. can you do? Who can, you know, who can you meet? Uh, what connections can you establish? So this year, since the pandemic, you know, didn't let up. And for us uh, here in this area, our numbers uh, were pretty bad. And so like, you know, we just didn't have any reprieve really until just very recently. And our vaccination rates weren't you know, like uh, the the movement of vaccines weren't wasn't happening really fast. 
that um, I was like, okay, we're here for a long haul. What am I going to do? Yeah. So I started learning more about, um, f- first of all, food, as in like, let's say the food that we eat normally has a lot of spices that are not local. And so what, what did people used to eat before they had like spices from Asia? How, like, was it just bland food? And then I started learning that no, in fact, there are um, tons of plants with all these diverse flavors that are totally like spices, European native spices. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I started incorporating that into my life. And then um, as Jen was sharing, because I share my garden with her a lot, um, I continue to have this kind of person-to-person communication with my landscape and with with the plants there and the insects there and the animals there. And part of my practices are to do with asking the land what it what it wants what it's doing and aligning with it you know not in like a meek way but it's like we're partners we're co-creating this space mm-hmm. and since i'm not going anywhere and i'm not doing anything else i better get really comfortable <laughs> with my partner <laughs> yeah so at the beginning of spring i asked the garden what it wanted what it wanted from from me what can i do for you and what i got back was you need to plant more herbs and berries. And I was like, can I plant vegetables? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> and sure enough, it, and I planted herbs and berries and I planted my vegetables, but the herbs are what has really taken off this year. And our vegetables, strangely, are quite stunted. <laughs> I was telling Jen this the other day. And I was like, this is weird from a person who grows like bumper crops of tomatoes every year yeah. uh nope not this year and it's not that the plants are not doing well but it's really like the message was the land was, was saying you want to get acquainted with the herbs so it's like <laughs> making like a very meaningful face at me. you want to get acquainted with the herbs and i was like do you mean like maybe making medicine yes <laughs> making uh-huh. medicine so um for the first time in my life I started getting much more into making medicines you know like I've always like harvested herbs for tea and things like that but this is a whole new level so I started learning how to make tinctures and how to wildcraft what grows around us and really getting deeply intimate in this other way and what I'm learning is that there's a new level There's a level of intimacy that happens when you eat the food in your land. There's a level of intimacy that happens when you forage what already grows. So it's like there's this gift there for your life. Um, you know, I'm saying your I mean there's a gift there for my life that I just get to like walk into a wooded area and pick some nuts, and there's like all this nutrition and all this life force in the food that I'm eating, and it's right there, and I didn't need to do anything for it you know I didn't have to work for it it's like a real a change a felt change in the experience of like having to work for existence Mm. it's not that I don't have to work I have to walk there I have to pick I have to shell process you know but it is a connected kind of work and that has been over time you know really uh, feeding my way of relating with the land and there's a huge next level I'm learning that when you connect with the specific herbs for medicine and it's not the same as the food um there's i I don't know if i could describe it exactly but i am experiencing it as learning a different level of intimacy and um an aspect of that a level of intimacy is also the that i get to kind of like connect with every single plant and check its vitals as yeah. I'm harvesting and is this the right place to touch this plant and to take some of it for my experiments as I'm learning or is this one does it need to stay because it needs to belong you know it's doing other things it's not for me yeah. and and what are the differences between them and so it's like really minute awareness that I don't need to have if I'm like picking fruit or picking nuts or harvesting yeah. greens 
it's a completely different minute awareness and um, being aware also of the, the timing when I'm harvesting things, will the medicine be potent or not? Is, do I prefer for the medicine to be milder because I'm just experimenting? So it's like getting really in there into yeah. high resolution relating and then having and having the chance to take that medicine and then um, be altered, have my chemistry altered by from within us again to a really different level of intimacy. So I am um, I'm experiencing that and I'm experimenting with that and cool. um, like learning learning new levels of the abundance that there is that is present in this non pristine land quote quote yeah. in this nature yeah. um, that is yet you know incredibly rich and as I go about it, of course, then I also get to meet a lot of um, other creatures that I might not have been paying attention to, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of my fermenting business oh over God. here. <laughs> I mean, that's a whole other story, but yeah, like the fermenting and getting, oh, fermenting foods and working with foods in a totally different way than yeah. I was ever taught. Um, so like really, you know, old style, uh, food prep and storage and from you know taking it from the garden preparing it in a certain way fermenting it like you know living off of that instead of always buying something in a can like a, a sauce in a can or whatever um and getting a, yeah kind of getting a relationship with like the micro um the microbes and also my own micro uh my microbiome microbiome um and and this kind of different relationship with like the t tiny minute life yeah yeah, it's very cool. Well, because we learned uh, fermentation from you, and here we are also <laughs> doing. Well, fermenting. we can we can thank Orlean because uh, thank he was the, he was the the pioneer, and then you know, and then he inspired me. Yeah. So yeah, and now I'm like a total um, convert. Total convert. I love it. Yeah, I absolutely. <laughs> yeah, love same it. here. It's same changed here. the way I cook. I cook as well. I mean, so, um, and it's allowed me to, yeah, connect to food totally differently than uh, than it was before. So, uh. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, um, it's like something that that happens at a different level that is not like what we talk about a lot. You know, no. when we talk about food. It's not what people mean when you know this kind of relationship. No, uh -uh. and I mean, with the, with life being so busy and online and and everything, there's no, there's less of like a, you know, we prepare food together or like the, the family or the community, you know, gets together and prepares tomato sauce for the next year or they yeah. make cans or this kind of thing. Like I, growing up, my grandma always canned everything and from her garden and all these things and. Um, I mean, I thought that was like just art of the past or something. And I'm, now I'm like, oh my God, yeah, this, this this can be done. But I wouldn't have heard from it from my local community or something. It's not like, you know, I would do this together with something that sort of had to figure out in a totally new way. Um, I love that you're saying that because that, that's exactly the experience I'm having. Um, I, I started with the whole thing this year of collecting plants. I started with like, elderflowers and we've had like this beautiful bloom of elder uh, in the elder bushes and I was like oh, we should make something with that. And I'm like I don't know how to make that I only know that the green parts are poisonous and that mm -hmm. I and then you know I would look up recipes and it said like yeah pick off the elder um flower cluster and put it in this like I make syrup and so I like put it in the syrup and I'm like how do you pick how are you supposed to pick them it's the kind of thing where you'd need your grandma to show yeah, exactly you. yeah and I'm like oh god I'm having to take the internet like take all these alternative Same. routes and and discover this from scratch and um I learned about nettle seeds which I posted on Instagram yeah. about and I had to learn that there's different ways of doing it. And there was one of my harvests where I had picked the, the branches and I had like let them dry. And then I was sort of like processing them like this. And the nettle um, residue got all over my clothes and all over Oops. my floor. And it was still stingy. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, everything says like, yeah, by now the nettles, A, don't sting. And B, they're dry, so it shouldn't sting. I don't know about these ones. 
So again, it's that's the kind yeah. of like granularity because my nettles, when dry, are still pretty potent. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. And if, I mean, you know, this is, of course, you know, very romantic sounding, but if you had, if you were like with your, you know, your grandma lived next door and she yeah. knew the history of the land and how that, then you would never even think that, you know, um, the, we, I had posted about her before, but, uh, and I don't know if I'm saying her name right, but Nitsiki is the, the Chinese woman who does yes. like all of this beautiful, these videos that show about um, growing food and making it and, and everything. Um, and like, you can see her, she grew up, her story is like that she grew up there with all of this, her whole family like knew about the land and they, she learned all these things since she was a kid. And so she just has all of this art of this kind of mm -hmm. country life, uh, you know, farming and everything else. I, I love watching her, she's so inspiring. But I mean, I sometimes think, ah, oh. I mean, I didn't have that at all <laughs> or, yeah. or very little. I mean, I had my grandma who, who did quite a bit, but I, I never, at that back at the time, I thought that was like something grandma does. I didn't really, I wasn't involved in it. So I didn't like learn the art. And plus now I live on the other side of the world. So <laughs> anything I would have learned regionally wouldn't apply over here. <laughs> well, that's another thing that it, it drove home. Like I'm a, an expat here. I yeah. just, I, I, my body doesn't belong to this land yet. And yeah. I need to learn it from scratch. And the things that my grandma did teach me, they only apply to her bioregion. And that's, a thought <laughs> yeah well it's something yeah. i've thought about like if there would be a you know what you're seeing all the disasters around like if there would be a disaster here I, there's a lot i don't know yeah. because i'm an expat i've lived here for four years i like it i have local people that you know i that i care about and that i can count on but you know i I'm not from here i don't I didn't grow up knowing and I, you know, knowing everything about it and how everything works. And so I've taken time to really inform myself, what would I do if, who would I call on? How would that work? Uh, it's yeah, it's like very local, <laughs> local, 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 <laughs> relearning how to be local. Yeah. And yet there's this reliance on the, in the internet, in my case, I'm sure in yours too. Yeah. Also in mine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. It's, it's a total different, you know, it is a new wild. It, it, it's a new wild and it's never going to probably be the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So I, I'm aware of the time, so we should probably wrap up, but do we, did anybody ask any questions? I don't think so. From what It I doesn't think. look that way. I'm just going to okay. refresh over here on my phone because I can't open the browser while we're on call. It doesn't look like it. Okay. We have captions, auto-generated captions on Facebook. Oh, I can only imagine how great those are going to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do we want to invite people to comment after the fact? And then we'll yeah, you sure. know if, sure. if you want to. Yeah, because I mean, it could be fun to also hear what they're doing. So whatever yeah. you're right. doing to rewild, share with us. And I mean, we could start a little post conversation about it because um, this is the whole point. I mean, that's why we're here. Okay, we talk about this. We're not doing it perfectly. We're not heroes. We're just doing what we're doing. We're and just we trying. Yeah. I mean, because if you think about like the new wild, I mean, as we were talking about that, I'm thinking like, I mean, a lot of my adult life has been sort of composed family or, or this kind yes. of thing, like figuring out who I can count on, you know, wh where I live, which is very far from my family, um, who I can count on, like also intellectually, which is a lot of why I did the gifted specific work. Um, so I think there's also this kind of composed thing and it's important for us to be speaking about these things that don't, maybe aren't very, you know, tech or, whatever they're kind of these local simple things but i think it's very helpful for for us to be talking about it just to give ideas and jumping off points and little bits of inspiration yeah and definitely hearing from the viewers and people in our community what uh, things you're doing that maybe you haven't had a chance to talk about because of yeah. the composed factor yeah but now that there's like connection points then the the conversation can get bigger yeah yeah, yeah, so share with us. Um, and then, um, you know, if you were wanting to explore further on the topic, we have been posting about it for the last eight months. So go look in our uh, history of posts and you'll see also Karin's um, website, uh, mermaidforest.com has all sorts of inspirations for rewilding. 
And um, for those of you who are in the gifted leadership space or just gifted and leaders, um, I have a course coming up. A lot of what I have learned over the last couple of years doing iHeartEarth is being distilled into a course format. So for somebody who's wanting to join, we can put the, the link is already um, in a set, like a separate post, but we'll, we can put the link in the comments here just to make it easy to find. Yeah. And um, this course is a real trailblazing that you're doing. And um, I, you know, I've been a bit of behind the scenes in conversation, so I could say it's going to be really comprehensive and um, really complex and yeah. rich. And it's going to be, you know, for the gifted community. So with gifted peers working at a complexity level, that's, um, you know, something that you wouldn't necessarily find and in a more mainstream place, although I'm sure there's many, many gifted people in leadership in the environmental yeah, for sure. and regeneration world, but yeah. it's gonna be a one of a kind thing. And it's the first time and that's always very special. Yeah, I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> it's come straight from the heart, so yeah. yeah. Um, and then we will be doing a few events here and there in the next couple of months. Um, one thing we'll be doing soon is having a, an earth listening experience with uh, my friend and our collaborator, Esther Goldinger. Um, so stay tuned for that. That'll be a private thing. I like it'll all be a sort of private call, but open to open to everybody, but it won't be on um, Facebook Live. And then uh, we'll be inviting a few other people to come and share about their uh, experiences and practices. People are in the nature space, meditation space and share about what they have been, how they've been uh, navigating these times and how they've been helping their clients and any wisdom that they wanna share with us. So stay tuned. Yeah. Very yeah. exciting. Doing things interesting things, yes, indeed. Oh. So wherever you are on the uh, rewilding journey, we're glad you're doing it. Glad you're joining us. Knowing people are out there doing it is also always helpful. Even if I don't even know what they're doing, I just know that they are doing it. So keep at it. Well, till next time. Till next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Karen. Thank you.